Well, the uh, I talked on this yesterday because I'd forgotten all about having to talk about something at 6.30, so I hope you, none of you were there then. I'm sure you weren't. No one would be here now who was there then. It'd be so foolish. <laughs> but last night, sure enough, I got another one of these, this time by a seminary teacher. They're sending them all the time. You may have seen these. Why would anyone want to fight the truth? We'll start out with that then. At the last April conference, these were circulated. I've had a hundred copies, people sending me from everywhere. If it were some great discovery of anything. With this uh, disarming title, Why Would Anyone Want to Fight the Truth? The author then treats his readers to a course on Egyptian symbols, in which his interpretation is to be taken as the truth and Joseph Smith's as the non-truth. Um, his whole argument is that uh, one of these symbols couldn't possibly mean as much as Joseph Smith says it does. He shows us a symbol consisting of four lines. This is the payoff, the punchline, the end of it. And um, with the remark, quote, in Egyptian, this, co this could be no more than a single Egyptian word. Well, now, how does he know that? Has he apparently never heard of synthetic languages uh, and has no idea how much a single word can contain in some idioms? In Arabic, for example, every root consists of just three consonants, never more and never less, and it's pronounced as a single syllable in the mustar, in the basic form. It can be pronounced as two, but most commonly it's in the single sy syllable of the form fal. Um, so, look at the... Yet there's hardly a root in the whole dictionary that doesn't require a whole English sentence to explain it. Take one of the page one of the dictionary. This is the first page of an Arabic dictionary. What's the first root? It's ab. You're not surprised by that, I'm sure. It means to make a special effort to prepare oneself to do a particular thing. It means to prepare yourself to do a particular thing. It doesn't mean to prepare yourself. It doesn't mean to do. But it has to be all that in the single syllable ab that is contained. That's the basic idea. It's as simple as you can get. Well, next word. Abit. It means to be a burning hot day. A hot, dry day, electric day, Santa Ana day, that kind of a day. It can't be a hot day, just a hot day, or a sultry day. It can't be a cloudy day. It can't be a warm day. It has to be a hot day and a burning, bright, hot day. Abbot. See, one word, all those things. And uh, what's the next word? Abath. To speak ill of another about something. Then Abed is the basic idea of cattle going astray because they have been neglected after they have been rather carefully herded for a while. Then we neglect them and let them go out because the pastures better, and then they become sort of wild, and that's called Abed, and that's the basic meaning of, of Abed. Uh, see, there's a little little story in, in each of these forms, because because the situation, you can have a synthetic language where situations don't change, see, where you have constant, well, we won't go into that now, but go, let's continue with the dictionary here, and uh, I like this next one, which is Aber. This is to give somebody else a needle to eat mixed with his food. You say, well, of all things, <laughs> that is not an uncommon practice. An Asiatic practice is to give a person uh, pieces of leopard, uh, leopard whisker and cut up in food, and that will cause abscesses that can never be cured, absolutely incurable. And it's uh, quite a common practice of people you don't know. <laughs> no, a woman who wants to get rid of her husband, and it's not an uncommon practice at all, takes leopard in the last issue of the, just about the last issue of the Illustrated London News. There's a picture taken near Qumran. Well, down near En Gedi there, south of Qumran, on the desert, uh, on the Dead Sea there, magnificent leopard they shot there. I mean, this is a very wild country down there. Well, anyway, you take a leopard, and you, uh, with his permission, chop his whiskers up into little tiny bits, and the woman mixes them uh, with a piece of hamburger, with meat, and you never know what you're eating. You've had it when you've done that. Because <laughs> they cause these... But this is what this word, um, aber, means. Well, notice, these are the simplest words, written with just three little scratches each. But each conveys not an English word, but a synthetic idea, a whole situation, a little drama. This idea is completely alien, alien to us, but it was not to the Egyptians. For example, here's a simple loop of rope, just like that. That's all there is to it. With, more no, with uh, no more to it than our letter O. What does it mean? Well, Gardner says the Egyptians called it Shenau, and it seems not unlikely that the idea was to represent the king and nobody else as ruler over all that which is encircled by the sun. All that in the innocent little loop. Well, we've given a lot of other examples here. We won't go into them. But the point is, uh, along comes some comedian faced with a fairly complex simple and tells us, quote, in Egyptian, this could be no more than a single Egyptian word. And if you don't believe him, well, then you're fighting the truth. And why would anyone want to fight the truth? <laughs> well, here are two statements. You have to get off on this now. We'll get to Spalding in a minute, because this leads up to him. 
In a book published, statement number one here, in a book published by the Deseret News Press in Salt Lake City, there's a statement attributed to one Joseph Smith to the effect that on the night of September the 21st, 1823, an angel appeared to him and introduced himself as Moroni. Statement number one. Statement number two. On the night of September the 21st, 1823, the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith. Both of these statements are true. But to accept the second one, or to reject it outright, would be to make a mockery of the truth. The statement was not made to be accepted or rejected out of hand, but to be questioned and examined. To ask whether a question is true or not, a statement, a, a proposition is true or not, is not to fight the truth, but to champion it. Recently, the same crowd that has taken such an interest in Joseph Smith's Egyptian grammar has reissued the Right Reverend Spaulding's little book, Bishop Spaulding, Joseph Smith as a Translator, first published in Salt Lake in 1912. The good bishop was another who couldn't understand why anybody would want to fight the truth. He dedicates his study, quote, to my many Mormon friends who are as honest searchers after the truth as he hopes he himself is. And then proceeds to violate the first principle of truth, truth hunting, by asking the public to accept without question or hesitation as the eternal truth the opinions of eight purported Egyptologists whose conjectures, as he knows, are quite well, uh, knows quite well the same public has no means of controlling. Are we to believe all this just because they said it? Exactly, he says. We must accept it because they said it and no questions asked. This is exactly the same argument that's been used so often against the Book of Mormon, the great time and space-saving device so favored by encyclopedias, the best authorities say, and so forth, to appeal to pure, unabashed, barefaced, shameless authoritarianism. That's what it is. The appeal is particularly effective in a field as remote from common knowledge as Egyptology. But there are certain dangers in invading such a field as well. If the Egyptologist has no one who can call him to account when he blunders, and he can't, who's going to question him? Neither has he anyone to award him a prize when he scores. Since he is often in disagreement with his peers, he must ever forgo the useful offices of an umpire to tell him in the outside world how the game is going. See, there's no control whatever here. If I, as an Egyptologist, if I were an Egyptologist, for example, said something, well, who's to question it? Just other Egyptologists. Well, we're not supposed to agree on anything, so we don't. But who are the public? You've got to take what I tell you. That's all there is to it. Well, in return for that immunity and that privilege, I have no guarantee, I can't give you any guarantee that I'm telling you the truth because there's no umpire, there's no one to, uh, to certify me to you. So you have to accept me as self-certified, and that's all there is to it. Well, that's a terrible thing. That's the purest authoritarianism, as we say. Well, Bishop Spaulding thinks his eight Egyptologists have won a smashing victory, and he asks why we do not applaud. We don't applaud because it's much too soon. There are a few questions that have to be cleared up first. Now, a side comment on this, this whole business now. Because it's being stirred up, it's being revived again, as you know, the Gerald Tanner and his wife in Salt Lake and so forth. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Egyptology as a trade is the peculiar occupational hazard to which its practitioners are exposed. The air of mystery and romantic appeal has always surrounded things Egyptian, has never failed to attract swarms of crackpots, cultists, half-baked scholars, self-certified experts, out-and-out -out charlatan. This is the bane of these men's existence but they have no right to resent it because they ask for it in a way. And certainly the church is, is not immune to it, um, and the B.Y. isn't either. When the Pearl of Great Price is serious... Well, we won't go into this. <laughs> the, uh, the real Egyptologist, constantly confronted with such characters and their antics, is understandably on his guard. He's quick to suspect and ever alert to the slightest uh, signs of wishful thinking or free and easy logic in those that approach him or his subject. But at the same time, you see, he's stuck with them. He can't complain. He's something of a crusader who feels bound to foster and encourage interest in his neglected field and is hesitant to give any sincere seeker or sucker the brush off. Well, what can he do? About every single day, almost on the hour, any Egyptologist in the country will get visitors and letters that are definitely <laughs> crackpot. What's he going to do? Well, he gets so he lives in that environment, and he gets extremely touchy on the subject. Apart from the wisdom of not offending possible patrons, because some of these people turn out to be loaded, and you can't just brush them off, you know. Uh, the Egyptian man is a romantic at heart, or else he would never have chosen such a field for himself, and has a secret and sometimes even rather obvious kinship with the glamour hunters. That, of course, makes him even more strict in restraining his own enthusiasm, and he shies like a thoroughbred horse at every rag and tatter of nonsense in the breeze. To expect a sympathetic word for Joseph Smith from such people is, of course, out of the question. They just can't afford it. A serious Egyptologist just can't risk it, as with the Book of Mormon, even to display undue interest. And the thing can jeopardize one's professional standing. 
But what are they to do then? When ambitious and aspiring anti-Mormons with a great display of zeal for pure, pure truth insist on forcing a showdown, demanding from the Egyptologists a definite, once-for-all, official statement that shall be forever beyond dispute or discussion. What are they going to do? No such statement is possible, and no one knows that better than the Egyptologists themselves, who are not nearly as confident about everything, and especially about Egyptian religion as they were 50 years ago. They knew all the answers then, and Breasted, who took the lead in this, he was the most opinionated Dr. Nerford, and he, he was never wrong, and of course they're faced with a very embarrassing situation at Chicago as a result of that, because most of the junk he collected for the museum there at the Oriental Institute is, is fakes, or forgeries that were sold to him. He'd, he'd bite on anything. But... <laughs> But they can't clean out the whole museum all of a sudden. Why <laughs> wouldn't cast very great luster on the name of Breasted? So they're gradually, progressively dropping out items here and there and replacing them inconspicuously. And before long, there'll be very little left that Breasted acquired. <coughs> um, but he was so sure. He knew all the answers. Today, they don't have that posture. Not nearly so much. From the beginning, the express purpose of those who have afe- appealed to high tribunals of scholarship against the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price has not been to stimulate discussion, but to put an end forever to all discussion, and that's what they want to do. If these men thought that by giving their opinion once for all, that would settle it, they'd gladly do it. But there's the other risk that it might not settle it, but just lead to continued discussion, and that would be disastrous, because you, do, you can never tell where that might lead. Well... But if the best expert learning of the day could settle an issue for good, then it would have settled it in 1912. Their statement would have been just as good today as it was then. Those who uh, have reissued this pamphlet of Spaulding's apparently think that the picture has indeed remained unchanged with time, but such an attitude shows a pretty low opinion of a vigorous discipline, as if they'd made no progress whatever. The past 50 years have indeed brought significant changes, as the next 50 years hopefully will. And if that's so... When will the final word be spoken? Well, brought up as we all are, in and on a doctrinaire Baconian positivism as rigid and fantastic as Marxist dialectic, few of us realize the degree to which our ideas of the world are conditioned by a strict, undeviating authoritarianism. It's so because they said so. I know of no better illustration of this than the effort of Bishop Spalding to discredit the Book of Mormon. The questions that any serious investigator would have to ask and answer before Spalding's thesis could be accepted seem never for a moment to have occurred to him or his colleagues, or for that matter to Latter-day Saints, for since there were two men, neither Egyptologists but both friends of Spalding, who had the temerity to ask a few common-sense questions, which so embarrassed the experts that Spalding confessed to the same two men. They were R.C. Webb, a New York engineer and journalist, and the other was B.H. Roberts that he never would have brought up the issue at all if he had thought that anyone had, had, would have the nerve to challenge the authorities. Once stated, <laughs> the question seems so obvious as to be unavoidable, but how rarely are such questions ever asked when the learned establishment has spoken? Well, now this Bishop Spalding was the Episcopal Bishop of New York, and he gave uh, courses, evening courses, mostly up at the U of U, Bible classes and things like that. Quite a popular man. And according to those who knew him, very charming and a convincing speaker who simply couldn't square the claims of Joseph Smith with a liberal and intellectual view of the universe uh, prevalent in 1912. For the very good reason, we suspect that such a view optimistically disregarded the facts of life. If he was acting in good faith, the reverend gentleman who makes a great display, both of his passion for truth and his love for the Mormons, has given us a remarkable demonstration of the degree to which a tightly closed and dedicated mind can assume a posture of complete openness and liberality. In an interview in far-off New York, arranged by the bishop himself with the reporter of the New York Times, his wholesome glow of Christian fellowship takes on a decidedly greenish tinge as his strategy becomes apparent. This is what the interview says. The breaking up of Mormonism through the desertion of the intellectual part of its membership is the future for the Prophet Smith's church, which Bishop Spaulding foresees. It is for that reason that he prefers to address the Mormons as his friends rather than to attack them, because it can be more damaging and sooner lead to the breaking up. For that reason, he's apologizing for being too friendly toward the Mormons. You say, well, I'm just, it's just my way of, uh, of destroying them more rapidly. Wearing his sweet strategic smile, the bishop disarmingly opens his little study with a magnanimous admission that others have been impetuous, ill-informed, and unscientific in judging Mormonism, and that the time has come for a cool, detached, objective testing of the claims of the prophet. Whereupon he launches into as rigged and spurious a test of prophetic inspiration as was ever devised by the scribes and Pharisees. (laughs) He begins with this, this statement. His book opens with a statement, If the Book of Mormon is true, it is, next to the Bible, the most important book in the world. I would grant that. Now, 
He points out that no definitive test of the Book of Mormon is possible, but suggests that it's possible to test the prophet's competence as a translator by examining not the Book of Mormon, but another of his translations, that contained in the Pearl of Great Price under the title of the Book of Abraham. In this document, according to Bishop Spaulding, quote, we have just the test we need of Joseph Smith's accuracy as a translator. And he's right. Here we have at our disposal all the necessary resources for making an almost foolproof test. Moreover, it's Joseph Smith himself who first suggested and submitted to the test. When the papyri of the Pearl of Great Price first came into his hands, Joseph Smith, having learned that the owner, Michael H. Chandler, had gone out of his way to solicit opinions of experts in the big cities where he'd exhibited his mummies, went into a room by himself and wrote out his interpretation of some of the symbols. Then he invited Chandler to compare what he had written with the opinions, quote, of the most learned. Chandler did and was properly impressed and voluntarily gave Joseph Smith a signed statement to the effect that his interpretation corresponded, quote, corresponded in the most minute matters to those of the authorities. Granted that the authorities of the time could not read Egyptian but had to guess what the pictures were about, the point remains that Smith here suggests exactly the test that Mr. Spaulding had in mind. It was also Joseph Smith's idea to submit the copies of the original writing of the Book of Mormon to the best scholars in America for their frank opinion. Granted again that neither Anton nor Chandler could read the Anthem transcript, nobody can read it today, it was still very important for them to be given a chance to speak their piece. Without that test, it would have been possible for the world to say forever after, yes, yes, Joseph Smith never dared to show his mythical manuscript to any real scholars. He never gave the experts a chance to express an opinion about it. But whatever Anton's opinions about the transcript were, he's written enough letters to various friends and other people to show that he did see them and was given a chance to criticize them, a good chance. And they show that he uh, was invited to study them and express his opinion about them. And he was certainly the best scholar in America and one of the best in the world in his time. And uh, so you can never say that he never had the chance or that uh, Joseph Smith never gave the experts the opportunity to look at his stuff. Joseph Smith then is willing enough to undergo the most objective test, but Spaulding is not willing to let him. This is no test at all, I soon see. The least the good bishop could have done was to follow the classic procedure used in the vindication of cuneiform scholars. Shortly after, when people doubted, well, 20 years after, when people doubted whether a cuneiform could be read or not, it was an easy thing for Grotefen to suggest a test. He says, well, let's just send to half a dozen different scholars, let's just send a, a cuneiform text without any comment or anything, just asking, what do you say this means? And when they come back, compare them, and we'll find out, no, that's the way to do it, obviously. And that's what he should have done here. That's, of course, what he doesn't do. Uh, this is obviously the way to proceed in this case. Joseph Smith has given his interpretation of three ancient Egyptian documents, the facsimile, see? And, it has actually, and he's actually challenged the world to give its own interpretations of the same. So we have only to do what was done in the cuneiform test, that is, send out three facsimiles from the Pearl of Great Price to various Egyptologists without comment, without telling them that others or what others are being consulted, simply requesting each to give his interpretation of the documents. That's all that was necessary. Then we can open the envelopes and invite the world to compare the readings of the experts with each other and with Joseph Smith's ideas. Now that's the test. And this is the one test that Spaulding was determined to avoid at any rate. What test could be simpler and fairer? Joseph Smith had put all the necessary ingredients for a simple foolproof test into Spaulding's hands and even showed him how to go about it, and Spaulding threw it all away. For instead of asking each scholar for his interpretation and letting the public judge for himself, this is the way Pauling put it, he said, I sent the original text together with Joseph Smith's interpretations to competent scholars asking each if Joseph Smith had translated correctly. Well, you can imagine the answer you'd get there. In other words, he doesn't ask for his interpretation, he's just asking, was Joseph Smith a charlatan, yes or no? That's all you have to say. You see. Well, uh, what a test. He says, with the idea that if they declared his translation to be correct, then it must be accepted as true. The question put to them, the experts, was not, what is your interpretation of these things, but instead, here is what the notorious Joseph Smith says about these Egyptian documents, was he right or wrong? This not only made it very easy for the doctors to answer, but carefully set the stage to avoid any possible danger that one of the correspondents might in an unguarded moment drop a word in favor of Smith. Whether each of the experts received the same covering letter from Spalding, we don't know. For though his little book, apart from the introduction, consists entirely of letters he received in reply, it omits the most important letter of all, the letter to which they were replying. The letter that set, the letter that set up the experiment and determined the state of mind in which each of the experts approached the problem. But he says he did send them each a copy of Joseph Smith's interpretation and asked them if it was correct. Whatever the covering letters said, and their omission can hardly have been an oversight here, with prating all these letters the way he does, 
They completely destroyed that atmosphere of cool and detached impartiality which Bishop Spalding professes himself so anxious to achieve. The replies are all quite emotional. The writers are decidedly wrought up. Three of them, in fact, are Episcopal clergymen. Spalding, uh, out of the eight, three of them are Spalding's subordinates. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and they, none of those three were Egyptologists either. You know anything about it? Uh, all of them understand perfectly well just what the Mormons claim for their documents and what would happen to the professional standing of any scholar insane enough to send in any reply but one. Spalding's brutal leading question gave his correspondents no choice. What would have happened in a fair test is indicated by what actually did happen a quarter of a century before. I may refer to that test of 1884, which was a very different story. If we have time, we'll refer to that one. But let me see now. What about the, uh, the panel of experts? That may be interesting to mention now. If the student is led to ask whether there's some peculiar affinity between Egyptology and the Church of England, the answer in the present case is negative, for none of these clergymen were, was an Egyptologist. Well, then why were they chosen, since the claim is that Spalding's work represents, quote, an extended inquiry among the scholars of the world, and that the efficacy of the best of the test depends entirely on the competence of the scholars. It's not only allowed, but imperative that we ask just how Spalding went about choosing his competent linguist, as he calls them. Spalding himself insists that only the best will do. He brusquely rejects, rejects the authority of Théodule de, Vier, de Viriat, who had written by far the longest and most careful study on the facsimiles in the Pearl of Great Prize, with the remark, quote, unquestionably, this matter is far too important to depend on the opinion of a youthful amateur. <laughs> Such an important matter deserves the thoughtful consideration of mature scholars of the world's ablest Orientalists, unquote. Amateur, de Veriat was more was no more an amateur than Petrie, whose early career remarkably resembles his own. He was a full-fledged Egyptologist and published much, whereas half of Spalding's authorities were not Egyptologists and never published a syllable in the field. Youthful, two of Spalding's informants were younger than de Veriat, and not half so competent. Thoughtful consideration, whereas de Veriat wrote a long study, two of Spalding's experts dashed off contemptuous, contemptuous notes of a hundred words in reply, and five of them wrote less than a page. None went into the subject nearly as carefully as de Veriat did. World's ablest Orientalists, who were they? Take them in order, just briefly. The order in which Spalding presents them. First, there's A. H. Sace of Oxford. He's called Dr. A. H. Sace, Oxford, England. Or to be more exact, which they do not tell, Reverend Archibald Sace, D. Lit, L. L. D. 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 <laughs> Spalding has conveniently omitted the religious titles <laughs> to keep the whole operation on a strictly nonpartisan, impeccably scholarly basis. But in that case, why bring Sace into the picture at all? He wasn't an Egyptologist. He was the most leftist of all Egyptian clergymen, uh, English clergymen at his time, and was always coming out with embarrassing statements in the press, denouncing the scriptures, old wives' tales, and ridiculing the superstition of anyone who believed in anything from Adam and Eve on. He would have nothing to do with it. Well, this man could be trusted, you see, to give an, an unbiased uh, answer to Joseph Smith. <laughs> uh, he was extremely temperamental and wild, and, oh, uh, he dabbled in about 60 languages. He was a, a wild little Welshman, you know, as these Welshmen are. Very picturesque and so forth. Very excitable, very anti-Mormon, and very anti-Bible, believe it or not. So what are you going to have? Well, second is the great Flinders Petrie, called Dr. W. M. Flinders Petrie. Incidentally, half the names are misspelled and the titles are wrong in these things. Uh, I don't wonder what he's doing. He became the grand old man of Egyptian archaeology. He was strictly self-taught, confining his whole activity either to digging or cataloging. His ingenious original and original chronological and historic reconstructions mark him as a man of courage, genius, and imagination, with few with whom few could argue and fewer still could agree. He had his own ideas. And about The next was Breasted, who was at uh, Chicago at that time, the dean of American archaeologists. His work, like Petrie's, is marked, quote, by a great breadth and originality of treatment, which means that his favorite theories are now obsolete. He condemns the Book of Abraham on one ground only, that it mentions that it preaches monotheism when he said the Egyptians knew nothing about monotheism or complete polytheists. Well, of course, that's absurd. No one would accept that today. But uh, he makes a lot of... Uh, of wild statements like that. He was always doing it. But Breasted <coughs> was very much interested in the Mormons. He had started out, his wife told me, he started out to make an analysis of the Book of Mormon, but dropped it, never did anything with it. The usual thing. You see, you're going to do a public service and settle the Book of Mormon question once for all. Never got around to it after that. <laughs> then, uh, next is Dr. Arthur C. Mace, Assistant Curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, Department of Egyptian Art. Well, all we've been able to learn about Mace is that he was a student of Petrie. And he tells us in one writing of his that he couldn't read Egyptian. Uh, had to have somebody help him, he says. 
And you'll find no mention of his name in any indexes or catalogs or bibliographies anywhere. As one of the world's ablest orientalists, he has ex escaped the notice of posterity with consummate skill, though to judge by the tone of his letter to Spalding, that was not his intention. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> The next one is quite amusing. This is Dr. John Peters of the University of Pennsylvania <coughs> in charge of an expedition to Babylonia in 1888-1895. Again, no mention of the ministerial titles. Peters was rector of St. Michael's Church in New York and had been canon residentiary at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, 1904-1910. His writings are limited strictly to popular works on the Bible, modern political history, and baseball. By no stretch of the imagination can he be called an Egyptologist. He never did anything in it at all. Uh, well, then there's Professor Mercer, whose library we acquired here at the BYU. This time he's called uh, Professor, Reverend Professor C.A.B. Mercer, Ph.D., Western Theological Seminary, Custodian Hibbard Collection, Egyptian Reproductions. At last a reverend, but made up for by all the other titles, which really mean that S.A.B. Mercer was a 32-year-old teacher in a Kansas seminary at this time. His splendid Egyptian library is now the proud possession we shouldn't mention this BYU, and from his own lavish notes contained in it, one gets a pretty good idea of his depth as an Egyptologist. What a character. Uh, we have long texts of his in which, well, after he was 50, elaborate cribbings and explanations in them are all wrong. I mean, you just wonder if he ever learned anything at all. But we, that, of course, we shouldn't say these things. But we can, we can do this in person. His last work, his one ambitious work, was a uh, translation of the pyramid text, which the reviewers, especially Antha, just tore to bits. Antha says he's constantly accusing the Egyptians of ignorance, which is really his own. Uh, <laughs> now, if Mercer can thus be charged with arrogant and unfair criticism of the Egyptians, what can we expect of the, useful and am of the youthful and ambitious Mercer when asked by his superior, Bishop Spaulding, to comment on the writings of one whom both men considered a religious imposter? <laughs> Then there's Edward Meyer, University of Berlin. Well, Meyer had written books and articles on the Mormons, a big book on, well, a, an important book on the Mormons in 1904, and made it perfectly clear what his position was regarding the supernatural claims of Joseph Smith or anybody else. He had nothing but contempt for such prophets as Ezekiel and things like that. He put as little faith in the inspiration of Bible prophets as he did in Joseph Smith. He could be trusted to participate in Spaulding's project to repeat what he had already said many times about Joseph Smith. He was perfectly safe. I mean, this man would... In other words, to ask any of these men now, was Joseph Smith telling the truth? Was he really inspired? Is this a correct translation or not? Well, what right answer could you possibly get from any of them doing it this way? Well, then there's von Bissing, who only specialized in, in uh, Egyptian art at Munich. And uh, to the list, we should add, he's Dr. Albert M. Lithgow, head of the Department of Egyptian Art of the Metropolitan Museum consulted him later. Lithgow later gave Spaulding full satisfaction in a long article in the New York Times because he was abroad at the time this, uh, this was made. But if Lithgow, like his lieutenant, Mace, who spoke for him, has left any trace of his work anywhere, it has not been significant enough to get him or it mentioned in any bibliographies or catalogs. Couldn't find it in Chicago or anywhere else, whether the man had even lived or not. Well... <laughs> the panel of experts is significant for the names it omits as those it includes. He says he wanted the best. But for, except for Breasted, the really big names in Egyptian language and literature are noticeably lacking. All the experts consulted are either ministers of Spalding's church or men of outspoken and well-known opinions about Joseph Smith. Now, but as if this were not enough, our faithful monitor, even after he's committed his case to the hands of his carefully selected and carefully briefed experts, will not trust them to speak for themselves. His book, fully two-thirds of his book is taken up with explaining their interpretations away with prepare with a preliminary discourse designed to lead the reader's steps down a carefully marked path to a carefully prepared conclusion based on a number of completely spurious propositions. And these are the propositions. First is that if Smith can be shown to be off the rails in the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Mormon is thereby completely discredited. You mustn't forget that this book called Joseph Smith as a Translator is written about the Book of Mormon, not about the Pearl of Great Price. He's tr trying to discredit the Book of Mormon. He says that's his purpose, to uh, show the world that it's a fraud. In going about this work in such a devious way, the author pays high tribute indeed to the Book of Mormon, a purportedly historical work over 500 pages long, which it would seem he can discover no direct or obvious proof of fraud. Instead of that, he has to turn to another work. He said, if the translation of the Book of Abraham is correct, is incorrect, then no thoughtful man can be asked to accept the Book of Mormon. But on the other hand, honesty, will all this honesty business, will uh, require him at whatever personal regret, with whatever personal regret, to repudiate it and the whole body of belief which has been built upon it. 
Here, stated in the language of uncompromising honesty and integrity, is a patently spurious proposition. It's spurious because the same reasoning would require the good bishop, when it was shown him that there are incorrect and unreliable passages in our Bible text, to reject the whole Bible, and with it, the whole body of belief which has been built upon it. He's going to be consistent. We are asked to believe that if Joseph Smith could have made a wrong translation on one occasion, it would follow inevitably that he had never at any time had a true gift of translation, or that one who is at times mistaken can never be right. Well, at no time did Joseph Smith claim the gift of translation was constant or permanent. If uh, Smith were a false prophet, even when he wrote the Pearl of Great Price, it doesn't follow that he was so when he dictated the Book of Mormon. Since Spalding's whole purpose is to test the book, he says, on its merits with severest objectivity, he's off to a poor start in asking us to judge entirely on the merits of another book, uh, translated under different circumstances, a different time and place, an entirely different method was followed, and so forth. We can't go into that. And a different type of book, different type of writing. Well, the second point... Spalding's second proposition is that he's testing Joseph Smith's competence as a translator. He's been hammering away at that. The title of his book, in fact, is Joseph Smith as a Translator. His whole object, as he explains, is to show, quote, that the whole body of belief based on Smith's teachings must be repudiated because the translation of the Book of Mormon is incorrect. We'd like him to give us a correct translation, I suppose. <clears throat> what are we to think, then, when we search carefully through the interpretations of Joseph Smith that Spalding submitted to the experts? and the interpretations they sent back to him in reply and discovered that in all of them not one single word of translation appears. Nobody translates anything. There are hieroglyphics. There is text on these, on these uh, plates, on these, but none of those. The, these fellows all say, well, they're illegible. They can't be read. None of them even translates one word, which is surprising because they can be read. You wonder what kind of Egyptologists they were to say they couldn't make heads or tails of that. Some of them even went so far as to say the whole thing was fake. Joseph Smith just wrote down signs he made up in his head. Well, anyone who knew anything about Egyptology wouldn't say that. These are obviously correct. They're accurate. I mean, an Egyptologist has no trouble at all reading them off. So one wonders, as I say. Um, <laughs> there's no translation. Well, Joseph Smith didn't translate the facsimiles at all. He merely gave some interpretations of symbolic drawings. And in reply, the eight scholars didn't attempt to translate a single word of the hieroglyphic inscription on the plates, which most of them said were illegible but contented themselves with supplying their interpretations of the same drawings. There's no translating at all on either side, but only an interpretation of symbols, which is by no means the same thing as translation of a straight, unillustrated, verbal text such as the Book of Mormon. The Book of Abraham is indeed put forth as, quote, a translation of some ancient records, but the experts never set eyes on that part of it. They're on the records, the Book of Joseph and so forth. The test had nothing to do with them. Neither Joseph Smith nor his critics has undertaken a translation of anything on the three facsimiles. All confine themselves strictly to an interpretation of symbols. Who's wrong there, you see? The third spurious proposition is that Spalding has submitted, quote, the original text used by Joseph Smith to the criticism of the scholars. He says, the original text with the prophet's translation are available for our investigation, unquote. Though he knew full well that the original text had been missing for many years. This is a very important point. Since if our experts are to pass judgment on Smith's translation, they must see what it is he's translating, or at least interpreting. They've accused Joseph Smith, most of them do, of having faked these, of having changed a lot of them. Some say he just made them up, others say no, yeah, they're real, but he made lots of changes, and he's altered things all over the place. <laughs> Making basic alterations in the facsimiles, and even out-and-out -out invention. Without the originals, you can't test these very grave charges. You say, well, where are the originals then? He says, we have them. No, we don't. He, know, he knows we don't. The plates in the Pearl of Great Price have suffered drastic alterations in the hands of various engravers. The ones we have today and ours are no good at all. They're the 1878 edition, repeated in 1912. The 1842 uh, engravings of Reuben Headlock in the, uh, in the um, Times and Seasons are good. They're very good. But the ones we have are worthless. You can never try to use those for anything. Um, no, en uh, no engravings are farther from the 1842 reproductions than those sent by Spalding to his age. But he's sent a special copy that was absolutely the worst, even worse than the ones we use today. <laughs> now, how could he say, I'm giving you the original text, Joseph Smith? Now, what does he say? As recently as 1963, my friend Professor Hughes at Chicago, due solely to bad copying, made the most terrible howlers interpreting these things. He took the wedge at eye on figure seven, facsimile two, for a fan of all things. But that's the way it was copied in this very bad uh, document that Spalding sent out. The symbol is very well and clearly drawn in earlier reproductions, but in the later ones, in circulation today, and especially in supremely bad copies circulated by Spalding as, as the original text, the engravers have simply made nonsense of the original. 
It makes all the difference in the world what text you're reading. See, all these main points. He's saying, this is my test, and it's not the test he's given at all. He says, first, I'm sending the most eminent scholars in the world. They were not that. They were unbiased, unprejudiced. They were not that. He says, I am um, proving thereby the falsity of the Book of Mormon. It has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. He says, I am testing his competence as a translator. There is no mention of his being a translator. There's no translation concerned here at all in the text. Then he says, I'm submitting the original text. They're not the original text or anything like it. The fourth and indispensable proposition to Spalding's thesis is that we can be sure that Joseph Smith's wrong because we know the experts in disagreeing with him have given us the right answers. We know what the true answers are. Well, they're not true today at all. Uh, they represent the science of the time. Of course, this, is, this comes later, this part. I don't know what they're talking about. Don't go into this now. Um, the uh, Jekyll begins his new study of Egyptian religion by noting, he says, it is vain from this time forth to seek to establish a, a theological and mythological system such as were conceived by the Egyptologists of the last century. And none were conceived with and propounded with more pontifical finality than those of Meyer, Breasted, Petrin, from Brissing. Those four men, the four good Egyptologists here, were the most opinionated, the most hidebound, the most uh, cocksure in the whole profession uh, of this time, and they were the ones writing here. They thought they had this. The system all worked out well. They hadn't at all, as Hezekiah uh, says. Today, no one is sure the way they were. This suggests a number of secondary propositions which Spalding must assume in order to make his case stick, but are nonetheless demonstrably false. He makes the common mistake of assuming that the latest word is the last word. Well, that's absurd, too. Uh, the present-day successor of Lithgow and Mace at the Metropolitan reminds us, this is this Eric Young, he says, in consulting your library, you should generally ignore books and statements published before the beginning of this century, since they are far out of date and frequently contain numerous inaccurate statements. But these were the books these men were using. 1912, these were the books they had written. This was the last word then. And he says, now, uh, Eric Young says, ignore them, pay no attention to them, because they're so out of date, they're full of inaccurate statements, we can't use them. But this is the basis of this 1912 performance. Uh, and we can only ask how today's conclusions will look in another 50 years and hesitate to make definite statements. Well, it's common in cases like this to accept a label as an explanation. And this is a foolish thing, but they do it all the time. The descriptive sciences are fond of this. We are told, for example, that a certain figure in the facsimiles is merely Osiris or merely Mott, as if that explained it. Well, you don't know who they are yet. Nobody knows exactly, certainly, what they, what they meant in all situations. Uh, when you say that they think that by merely naming mythical figures they have recognized in the place they have exhausted their significance for the Egyptians, ruling out all interpretation for their own. Well, that won't do either. It was characteristic of scholarship of 1912 to accept one interpretation of a thing as excluding all other interpretations. We know it doesn't mean this, but because it means this. Well, B. H. Roberts pointed out some weaknesses there that the experts differed among themselves, and Lithgow said, oh, yes, we can do that because the Egyptians would give a number of different meanings to the same symbol, but you can't do that. Uh, <coughs> uh, which brings us to another basic proposition of Spalding, namely that among his experts there is practically complete agreement as to the real meaning of hieroglyphs. This is important to have them agreeing. See, this is why he had to have them... There's all this uh, co uh, cooperation going on. He doesn't send it to each one... Uh, saying, well, what do you say of this? And then we'll compare later on. No, he lets them know that the others are in it and who they are. Aside from the fact that not one of them ventures an opinion as to the meaning of a single hieroglyph, they were in complete agreement on just one point, and that was that Joseph Smith was an imposter. Their ringing denunciations leave no doubt on that yet. That's the one thing they all agree on. Say says it is difficult to deal seriously with Joseph Smith's impudent fraud. Petrie says it may be safely said that there's not one single word that is true in these explanations. Breasted says it very clearly demonstrates that he was totally unacquainted with the significance of these documents and absolutely ignorant of the simplest facts of Egyptian writing and civilization. Note how simple it is now. May says the Book of Abraham, it is hardly necessary to say, is a pure fabrication. Joseph Smith's interpretation of these cuts is a farrago of nonsense from beginning to end. You see, they agree on this, the same thing. The idea that this is very simple, it's very elementary, that anyone could be able to check up on it very easily. It's difficult to deal seriously with this matter. It's hardly necessary to say, and so forth. It's all too obvious. After all, Dr. Mace assures us, five minutes study in an Egyptian gallery of any museum should be enough to convince any educated man of the clumsiness of the imposture. And Professor Mercer gracefully demurs. A criticism in his explanations 
could be made, but the explanatory notes to his facsimile cannot be taken seriously. By comparing his notes with any elementary book on Egyptian language and religion, this becomes unquestionably evident. And the New York Times man in his interview says, the walls of the Egyptian rooms of the Metropolitan Museum proclaim the pearl of great price to be a fraud without further comment. Then why bother the experts with anything so elementary, a matter that any educated man can settle for himself in five minutes, or any elementary textbook on Egyptian language and religion can put one right on why all this trouble, you see? Very well, with things as plain and simple as that, we can indeed expect total agreement among the world's foremost scholars on a matter of ABC Egyptology. Just too childish, but what do we find? What, for example, do the great men say about facsimile one? De Veria says, the soul of Osiris in the form of a hawk. Incidentally, Professors Sace, Mace, and Mercer, who really know very little about it, didn't say a word about it. They had nothing to say on the subject. But De Veria says, the soul of Osiris in the form of a hawk, Osiris reviving on the funeral couch, the god Anumus bringing about the resurrection of Osiris. Petrie says, the well-known scene of Anumus preparing the body of a dead man. The hawk is Horus. The figure is the dead person. Figure three is Anubis. Breasted said, number one, depicts a figure reclining on a couch with a priest officiating. The reclining figure represents Osiris rising from the dead over his head a bird, which is his sister Isis, and so forth. Well, the time is running out, so we summarize it this way. This leaves us with six brief statements. Professors Sace, Mace, and Mercer have nothing whatever to say about facsimile one. This leaves us with six brief statements pointing out only the salient points that any elementary... Just two minutes and you should see this, you see. <laughs> Uh, the extremely conventional and commonplace Egyptian representation known to scholars, Breasted says, in untold thousands of copies and familiar to the point of boredom. And here we see the value of having no collusion among the experts. Spalding has led them in a chorus of denunciation of Joseph Smith sung in perfect unison, but when they undertake to sing solo without his direction, strange things begin to happen when they venture opinions about these themselves. Not, on not one single point do all our seven agree. No two of them agree on all seven, on all points. What to some is just a dead man, to others is no less than Osiris. What to some is an ordinary priest is Anubis himself to others. What to some is a reviving of the body, to others is a laying away of the corpse. What to some is a bird departing, to others is a bird returning. What to some is the soul of the dead man, to others is <coughs> no less than Horus himself, and to others it's the lady Isis. And this is what Spalding calls practically complete agreement as to the meaning of the hieroglyphs. What has this to do with the meaning of hieroglyphs anyway? Here we find not a single word of translation of hieroglyphs. Uh, no text is translated by anybody, and yet this is as far as our authorities go in explaining the documents. How can this, of all things, be, he says, the ultimate test of Joseph Smith as a translator, by which he was triumphantly announced in 1912, quote, the authenticity of the Pearl of Great Price has been destroyed completely. Well, um, I, we said that... Uh, there was a test in 1884. We should mention this. We have to get along here. And this is what it was. They, um, Professor Samuel Birch at Oxford was very much interested in hypocephaly. You notice the, the second uh, facsimile is this round one, which is a hypocephalus. And so he collected all that were available in England uh, throughout the world, and they had a symposium about them, and he corresponded with Dvorak in Paris, and uh, they got a lot of people interested in it. And for some years, a, a lively correspondence was kept up, but they analyzed all of the major hypocephali. I have them all here. There are analyses, about 30 of them. And uh, beginning with the 1827 one, in 18, September 1827, eight years before the appearance of the Pearl of Great Price, a mummy was enrolled in the, unrolled in the Uffizi Palace in Florence, where it had reposed since 1824. It was a solemn and impressive occasion with the Duke himself in attendance. The report of the event, however, was not published until 1855. Now, we have long descriptions of these mummies and these hypocephali found with them, and they compared notes and drew general conclusions from them. We can't go into the separate ones, but these are the things they all have in common. Now, you bear in mind the second, the second uh, facsimile in the facsimile in the Pearl of Great Price, the round astronomical one. They all agree on this. Now, the interesting thing is that some of the men engaged in this enterprise were Petrie and von Bissing themselves. They knew all about it. All these men knew about it because it caused a great flurry at the time. This was 25 years before this Bishop Spalding thing. They knew that, this, that these uh, hypocephali had been analyzed and examined without any prejudice toward the Pearl of Great Price. That, that didn't issue. And since then, others have been found as late as 1951, an important one was found. The interpretations go on again without any reference to the Pearl of Great Price. Well, this is the test we want. What do these people say when their minds are not clouded by prejudice? When they're just dealing with these things on their own, then we can see what they say 
and see how they compare with what Joseph Smith said about this. Now, isn't it interesting that none of these men, when they talked about this hypocephalus in the product, ever mentioned this test, this uh, study that was made in 1884, this big international study of the subject. They kept strictly hands off. Well, why not? Well, because it was very favorable to Joseph Smith, that's why. When they, when they make these statements, you see that he, he got nothing right, that it's just a farrago of nonsense, then how would they explain things like this? The first point they all notice about these hypocephali, and uh, this one in the Pearl of Great Price is uh, one of the best and thoroughly typical, one of the most elaborate. It's not the most elaborate. There are two more elaborate than it is, the Mo Papyrus and the, uh, at Paris and the 8445 in the British Museum. But uh, it's a good one, and it's typical. And this is what they say about all of them. First, the designs are cosmic, being concerned with the sun, moon, planets, constellations, the earth, and the utmost reaches of space. Now, there are no stars. There's nothing to show on our facsimile around one that it is an astronomical treatment. Most of these others have stars all over them and look very astronomical. But this one wasn't. So that's a very good guess for Joseph Smith to regard the, say, his as a cosmic pattern as being, as a matter of fact, what it was, you see, as being cosmic design, concerned with the sun, the moon, the planets, the constellations. So secondly, that though the sun figures prominently, it's not the real source of power here, which is a higher one, invisible to men, as called in the, the unseen and mysterious principle of Ammon, of which the visible and brilliant power of Ray is that of the sun and is but a transmission. The Nick Carlsberg Apotheca, uh, Apotheca, Nick Carlsberg, uh, yes, Apotheca uh, Papyrus, makes this clear and brings us up to date. This is so. So the Pearl of Great Price also pays its respects to the sun, but as a secondary object. Third, the theme of generation as creation is prominent, being presented as the power behind the resurrection. What we have in the hypocephali, where in general, de Horak concludes, was reference particularly to the material creation of the world, the reconstruction of being, whether it is a resurrection or a creation, the celestial and eternal generation of the sun or the resurrection of the individual. The whole purpose of this thing is to bring the individual, you see, into the system, to get him in orbit in the cosmic system. See, it's put under his head as sort of a burning glass to concentrate the power from a distant star and to keep a spark of life in the body against the day of resurrection when it will return. And they talk a lot about this thing. But it's to tie him up, see, with the big cosmic pattern of things. Fourth, our hypocephali are preoccupied with time cycles, with risings and settings, revolutions and returns, comings and goings, the eternal recurrence one represented by the two ships found on all of them. There was quite a recent study by Elizabeth Thomas on that. Of course, we need refer only to the explanation of facsimile to again, where you're always talking about times and cycles of a thousand years of one and one year with another and so forth. Fifth, the information is treated as secret, the nature of the high God being one of the great mysteries. On all the major hypocephali, his name is actually written in cryptogram. There's much traffic in secret words and meanings, and of course the name is written in cryptogram in our uh, Pearl of Great Price too. Again, the theme in our explanation is not to be revealed at the present time or to be had only in the house of the Lord or if the world can find this out, well and good. But they make a great thing on this is not to be given to everyone. This is secret. In fact, the hypocephali all belong in one generation to one family and belong to priests, people of very high religious standing who have received all the mysteries uh, of royal and, priest, uh, and priestly blood and they're not found in commoners' tombs and not found at any other time or place, just in one family. So they're a special, very special thing. Only about 40 of them have been found to this day. They all come from Thebes, they all come from that area there, and from a priestly family that came from Asia. Uh, strange stories about them, and we won't go into that. That's the positive thing. We're just talking about the negative things here. Sixth, for all his monotheistic emphasis, the picture is always a complex one, with a hierarchy of powers and degrees. The main theme of the hypocephali, we're often reminded, is the transmission of power from the ultimate and utterly inapproachable source to the body in the tomb through its theories of intermediary stars and planets, this idea of transmitting power from one body to another. The hierarchical theme is, carries on throughout. And seventhly, the special nature of the documents. Their exalted secret teaching is confirmed by the fact they seem to be found only with persons of high priestly or royal rank, though other funerary documents from the old kingdom are found buried with people of every class, not these. These documents were originally, uh, well, eight, and they contained foreign names, and many of them, and uh, many, and may be themselves a non-Egyptian invention. Uh, Professor Birch himself said they seem to have a Chaldean background. Well, there you are again, for the great price. They're not a native Egyptian custom. I say, they, they don't go back to the old Egyptian customs at all. You don't find them in graves everywhere. And just, don't, just one family, and they're foreigners too, and uh, very special. They have these secret names in them. They contain foreign names and may themselves be a non-Egyptian invention. 
the, the practice they represent, in fact, goes back to Mesopotamia. It's not Egyptian. It's not used normally at all. Then, another point. All the big ones refer to the place of eternity, the center of activity and shrine of holiness at Heliopolis, the temple at Heliopolis, which represents the center of the universe as represented on the earth, the cult of which they represent. And the word, the name of Heliopolis it recurs more than once on our hypocephalus in the Pearl of Great Price. It's mentioned twice, in fact, on the rim. The great shrine, it says, the great twice exalted high secret temple at Heliopolis, where these things are done. So it's mentioned there, and these, of course, refer constantly to that as representing the earthly point of contract, the place of power, as Gardner says, on the earth for these things. Well, another point. Uh, the four points of the compass are conspicuously represented all the time. Well, we get that too. Another point, central and most conspicuous figure is a deity combining all the qualities and powers of the others in himself, being central, hidden, invisible, illuminating, and giving life to all things forever. These are the epithets given to him on the hypocephali. He is the one who sits in the center with the two faces or four faces, and he is the one who is himself central, hidden, invisible, illuminating, and giving life to all. And that's what Ammon means, uh, abiding and hidden too. Twelve, the idea of transmission of light from one body to another is conspicuous. All are agreed that the purpose of the hypocephalis itself is to transmit heat and life from a heavenly source to an earthly body. Transmission theme. This entails the exercise of an awesome and mysterious power to which the hypocephalis specifically and often recur. Well, now that's pretty good guessing for Joseph Smith, see, and they don't give him any credit at all for this. And then there are other things here. Um, so, you start out any any uh, special study, I suppose, the Pearl of Great Price, considering these objections, the way they're taken, this is, this is the way of authoritarianism. It's a, good, it's a good illustration of the methods these people pursue, quite sincerely. Now, I think Bishop Spaulding thought he was really doing a, a scientific and objective study here with all these tricks that come in. We become quite uh, unaware of these tricks we're playing, because I say we have been ourselves so uh, thoroughly indoctrinated with this Baconian positivism, the idea that, there's a, that you prove things, uh, that you confirm things, that you verify, you don't do that at all. Of course, questions always remain open, and one question leads to more questions. So nobody wants to get this thing stirred up today. Everybody wants to leave it alone, because once the discussion gets going, as I said, you never can tell where it leads. It is bound, its purpose of any serious discussion is to discover the gaps and flaws in our knowledge, so we can take care of them. And that's the m one thing in the world that experts don't like to discover, or at least have made public. At present, you see, Things stand as they were in 1912. They have everything to lose and nothing to gain by further discussion. As you see, further discussion will inevitably show where they were, did not have all the answers, and we are not entirely wrong. Joseph Smith wasn't a complete fool. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's the only way anything else is going to be discovered. And if these people, if the Lord <laughs> insists on, on it, these people will force the discussion on us, whether we like it or not. The same thing happened with the Book of Mormon, you see. The Book of Mormon is in a stronger position today than it's ever been because... Certain people wanted to make a serious criticism, wanted to knock it out once for all, wanted to get authorities to make definitive statements that would put an end to all further discussion. They have said this, this is what the experts think. We know the Egyptians came, we know the Indians came by Alaska, and that settles that forever and ever. It's as simple as that. Now, let's not talk about it anymore. Uh, the best, uh, the man most interested in this in, in Chicago uh, does not want to discuss it with anybody. He likes it, it fascinates him, and so forth. But he wants to avoid discussion because you see what that will mean. They don't want to get involved with any religious group or any associations like that because there's so many interests, so many conflicting interests and so forth. And as we said before, with all this glamour about Egyptology and so forth and everybody getting into the act and everybody having his interpretations of things, they lose their, their commanding position of authority and uh, they can't afford to lose that. So what, what if all our values did go? What if everybody, anybody could give his own interpretations? Well, that's perfectly fair, but we have to have some, some common court of appeal. Well, we're not going to get it out of a book like this one. This is exactly what, uh, what uh, Spaulding has done, and it's a perfect example of how not to go about um, discovering the truth these people are always talking about. Why should one want to, why should one want to fight the truth? Well, you don't want to fight it. You want to find it out. That's what you want to do. Well, if there are no questions, then, <laughs> I see the, the time is up. And uh, we should all address ourselves, and I, mean, I, I know we're all working in various fields here, and no two of us, I hope, are, are duplicating what anybody else is doing. Of course, you've got to get equipment first. You have to go the uh, Grammatica Encyclica first. 
And when you've got that, then, you, then you'll do your specializing. Unfortunately, we don't have much foundation here, and this is what makes it very difficult for anyone to specialize here. We, we have neglected our foundations in the church. And, um, uh, but I hope and pray that everyone may learn from the Holy Spirit what his particular calling is to be. The harvest is large and ripe, the workers are few, and the time is short. So we have no time to waste uh, bickering uh, among ourselves on matters of opinion, prestige, or anything else. When the world brings these things up, I suppose it obliges us to do what we can about it, but after all, this is not the mission of the gospel, which is to announce the plan of salvation to the people of the world. And if it's challenged, I suppose somebody can answer the challenge back. This shouldn't be our main concern. Now let's each ask of the Lord what he expects us to do in the time that remains to us. As I say, the time is short, and, the, and the, there's much work to be done. And this is part of your testimony. As part of your patriarchal blessing, this is part of your guidance. Each of us is supposed to know what he's supposed to do. The things you do aren't always the things you would choose to do. Sometimes you'll get started on a project and it'll be cut right off in the middle. The Lord decides you better be doing something else. And that's so too. And don't you, don't you try to decide what's most important. You have no means of knowing what's going to come up next. We don't know what things are found, things like that. And the Lord will prepare you against the time that's to come if you follow the promptings of the Spirit. That may we all do this, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.